Francisco Giant. And then, wait a minute, we thought he was going to be a New York Met. As of right now, on January 6th in this offseason, we still don't know where Carlos Correa is going to end up. Joining me now is MLB Network insider John Heyman, who has a lot more to say about this Carlos Correa situation. John, you had mentioned that there might be a couple of other teams interested in at least talking to the Carlos Correa camp. What more can you tell us? Well, we know one of those teams is the Minnesota Twins, the the team of uh, 2022, Carlos Correa. He did very well there. They certainly wanted him back. They offered him 10 years for close to $285 million. So uh, that looks like another possibility. Uh, the uh, Correa camp is at least talking to the Twins now or, or reaching out and discussing something. We shall see. I mean, I still think there's a decent chance he ends up with the Mets. Obviously, both sides are frustrated. It's been now more than two weeks since they cut the agreement for $315 million, and we still don't have a deal, as I heard you guys mention. I will reference back to J.D. Drew. It took 52 days to get that deal done. It was five years, $70 million, I believe, and they eventually worked out the language and got it done. So there's still time before spring training. It doesn't feel like there's time, but, but there still is time to, to work on this. Well, the numbers, John, for Carlos Correa's contract, a lot more than $70 million. Now, if he is talking to the Twins, though, the Twins, obviously, no disrespect to them, they're not going to have that same type of payroll as a New York Met team does. Is it a likely possibility that he would actually go back there, considering he elected free agency and went away from Minnesota to begin with? Well, it, it is a possibility at this point. I mean, uh, those are the two teams we know that are engaged to some degree. We believe the Mets are more engaged. And uh, obviously, the Correa camp led by Scott Boris is trying to work something out with the Mets. Uh, they've hit a few hiccups at this point, roadblocks, snags, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the language is tricky. Uh, how much will be fully guaranteed, what part might not be fully guaranteed. Uh, there's a lot to discuss there. There are lawyers involved. It isn't easy. We probably shouldn't be shocked that it's taken more than two weeks, and we're not probably not, shouldn't be shocked that they're frustrated because it's a difficult thing to to get over. If they are not able to get over it, uh, you know, I think the Twins look like the most likely option. We don't know if there are other viable options at this point. There were, we do know there were teams that lost shortstops, uh, the Red Sox, the Braves, the Dodgers, but uh, obviously they weren't in at this level. So uh, at this point, the likelihood would be the Mets or the Twins. I'll be, you know, we've had a lot of twists and turns in this, but I'll be shocked if it's not <laughs> one of those two teams at this point. And, and I still think, not just based on the uh, young lad Kylo's uh, T-shirt, I, I still think that, uh, and agree with you, that he probably would prefer to be in New York. He did seem very excited when they were able to, cut that deal, as did Steve Cohen. And I talked to him that early morning hours of December 21st, and he said we needed one more thing, and this is it, and this puts us over the top. And so I, I do think both sides have been motivated to get this done. Doesn't mean frustration will end up with no deal. Still could work on it. And probably in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about tricky contracts, you know, two weeks seems like a long time to us. It probably seems a long time to Carlos, but... Uh, you know, it's not the end of it at this point. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, two weeks is nothing when you're considering $315 million. I would want to make sure that everything is correct if I'm Steve sure. Cohen. Now, you know him way better than I do, John. So let me ask you this. Andy Martino with SNY is reporting that, you know, because these things are happening, the Mets are very frustrated with Carlos Correa, and they are willing to walk away. Are they willing to walk away? Steve Cohen does not seem to me like a guy that is not in it to win it, but he also obviously is an incredibly intelligent guy that does not make poor business decisions. Well, I would say at some point, both sides will probably be willing to walk away. I, I would not rule that out. All I can tell you is the excitement that both sides felt when the deal was done. Scott Boris told us at the Radon press conference how excited Carlos was that he tackled him in the hotel room in San Francisco where the press conference for the Giants had just been canceled when he heard that they had a deal with the Mets. So we know he was excited. We do think that Carlos loves the idea of going to New York. They did try to go negotiate with the Yankees, and I did talk to Steve Cohen. It was 2.45 our time at that point. He was in Hawaii, so it was 8.45 his time. He was very, very excited about this deal at that time. Obviously, that was before the physical. Obviously, some red flag was raised in the physical, and that's certainly thrown a complication into this, but I, I do think 
even if both sides are frustrated, I certainly believe that at this point, both sides are frustrated. I, I also think both sides are motivated to get this done. Steve Cohen and Scott Boris obviously have a very good relationship going back to Max Scherzer last year for $130 million. They got the Nimmo deal done this year, and they did agree in a few hours to do this deal, and I think they would like to complete it uh, and not walk away. No question about it. All right, changing our focus, John, from Carlos Correa and that saga, if you will, to Brian Reynolds of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Certainly not the same caliber of player by name recognition, but a guy that is incredibly talented, wants out of Pittsburgh. Other teams are interested, including the Yankees, but it is going to take a hefty price tag. What more can you tell us? Yes, as we reported today in the Post, uh, um, they've all, the Pirates had offered more than $75 million, which is a franchise record. I know a lot of people are poo-pooing that because they're one of three or four franchises that has not gone over $100 million, but their record is $70 million for Key Brian Hayes. So this is a record. He is three years away from free agency. We saw Sean Murphy take a similar deal for $73 million over six years with the Braves. That doesn't mean that Reynolds has to take it. We know as a free agent, he can get a lot more than that. I agree with you. He is a terrific player. I certainly understand him not taking it, and I don't blame anybody who decides they want to be elsewhere. That's certainly his prerogative, and uh, that does seem to be the case right now. As I understand it right now, the Pirates are pretty intent on keeping him. They are talking to other teams uh, to some degree. Uh, but I think their goal is to try to keep him and try to re-engage him in spring training and talks. And I do think they'll probably go up from the 75 or 76 million where they were. And maybe they can try to bridge that gap. Not sure it's going to be able to get done, but, uh, you know, they're going to give it a try. That That's what the Pirates would like to do. Reynolds, we're not sure that he will re-engage in contract talks. I know his side had mentioned Matt Olson earlier. They suggested a few figure less than that. Eight years, $168 million that Olsen got, understandably so, as he's three years away. But uh, certainly an interesting thing to keep an eye on uh, right now. Certainly Reynolds, a terrific, terrific player. And uh, right now they're kind of at loggerheads. John, it's not common a player three years away from free agency asks to be traded. I think the last thing you want on your team is a disgruntled player. Brian Reynolds obviously does not want to be in Pittsburgh. It's almost as if he's being held hostage for an understandable reason. The Pirates want to get what he's worth in return. But how do you think this plays out on the field in the clubhouse when a player obviously does not want to be there? Well, everything I heard is that he is a professional player. He will go to spring training and he will perform professionally as he has done in the past. So I don't expect anything uh, untoward or negative to happen there. We, we can remember this doesn't happen a lot in baseball, but we remember JT Real Muto had asked to trade same agent CAA uh, from the Marlins. And I think it took several months or even a year to eventually trade him. And he was dealt to the Phillies. Uh, eventually, but he uh, performed professionally for the Marlins in that period of time when he was not traded. So, you know, there really isn't that much the player can do other than ask or, or demand a trade, but the demand does not have to be answered. And the Pirates have reason to want to keep him. I think there's some logical people out there who are saying, well, they're probably not going to win in the next two years. He's, they've got three years to go. Maybe it does make sense to trade him, but from their perspective, it would be quite a public relations hit to trade him. They want to put their best foot forward. He is their best player at this point, and it doesn't send a great message to trade him. That you're basically punting on the next couple of years publicly, but I know there are some people out there who's going to say logically makes sense to trade him because you could get a Hall of Form. Not just the Yankees, just the Marlins. There's several other teams that would be interested in Brian Reynolds. Yeah, the Pirates do have some good young talent. Key Brian Hayes, as you had mentioned, of course, O'Neill Cruz. To name a few, John Heyman, MLB Network Insider, reporting live from Florida. We appreciate your time so much. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, Alana. All right, coming up here on High Heat, Randy Jones is.